Do you know how long this runs, the talk? And welcome. My name is Jim Wilson, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies. And I am delighted to invite you to uh, tonight's continuing performing queries, which is curated by Benjamin Gillespie, our events and outreach coordinator here at Clevis, and is co-sponsored by the Siegel Center. And I'm especially delighted to welcome our guests of honor, Arnaldo Cruz Malave and the wonderful Carmelita Tropicana, who are both. Wonderful friends to Clags over the years. Carmelita has hosted and performed at countless events and benefits, so we are grateful for all that she has done. And Arnaldo is a former board member. Before I formally introduce them, though, I would like to call your attention to our very busy spring calendar. As you enter, you probably received our hot off the press uh, glossy calendar, and we have a full series of events this spring. We will continue with our performing queries in May. Holly Hughes will be in conversation with Jill Dolan, so you won't want to miss that. Uh, we have a conference, which you may have heard about, called Home Nationalisms and Pinkwashing, which will be presented here at the Graduate Center in April. Uh, we also have an event with Arvishi Dad, Dean Spade, and Rosemond King in March. So, uh, if you are not already a member of CLAGS, please do so. We uh, rely on the donations and the memberships of all of you and all of our supporters uh, so that we can present events like this. Um, and if you are not already on our listserv, please make sure that you see one of our staff or one of our board members who are sitting at the table outside to make sure that you are receiving regular word and you can go to the uh, PLAGS website as well for information. Uh, so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Arnaldo Cruz Malave, uh, who will be hosting this evening's uh, presentation. Arnaldo is Professor of Spanish, Comparative Literature, and Latin American and Latino Studies at Fordham University in New York. His most recent book is Queer Latino Testimonial, Keith Herring and Juanito Extravaganza, Hard Tales, which came out in 2007 by Holograph. Uh, it's a book about the relationship between high art and queer Latino popular culture in the gentrifying New York of the 1980s. Uh, he is also the author of a study on the intersections of nationalism and queer sexuality in the prose fiction of the Cuban author Jose Isama Lima and co-editor with Martin Manolanson of Queer Globalization, Citizenship, and the Afterlife of Colonialism. He has published widely on Hispanic, Caribbean, and U.S. Latino literatures and cultures. His <coughs> essays have appeared in several anthologies and numerous junior journals. Arnold. Thank you. <laughs> it is a great pleasure and an honor to have a wide-ranging conversation uh, with someone who is a friend and also someone who I consider, who, who is an idol of mine, uh, Alina Troyano, better known to us and to the world as Carmelita Tropicana. Uh, to tonight's conver uh, conversation, which I hope you will participate uh, in the Q&A, will span three decades of Carmelita's uh, career, her astonishing career in the theater, in performance art, and in film. And it will be interspersed with uh, readings by, from, uh, from Carmelita's work, as well as seldom seen um, videos uh, of, of, the, of Carmelita's, archival videos of Carmelita's early work as well as her more current work. Carmelita, Carmelita Tropicana is an internationally celebrated performance artiste, as she would say, uh, because she speaks multiple languages and because she's good with the tongue. Um, <laughs> she's a distinguished playwright, screenwriter, an actor extraordinaire, um, a variety show hostess, hostess cabaretera, MC, 
or rolled into one of legendary proportions, um, and simply a, 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 a treasure, uh, a New York City and Clark's treasure, and, um, and a queer, one of our queer icons. She has been writing and performing since 1980 in venues such as the Wild Cafe uh, Club Chandelier, in Tar PS 122, Dixon Place, uh, the, the Public Theater, the Dance Theater Workshop, the Whitney Museum, the World Hall Museum, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, El Museo del Barrio, um, and in, in several uh, universities and institutions, New York, NYU, Princeton, yeah, Clacks, and the Cuban Graduate Center. She is the author of plays such as Memorias de la Revolución, Memories of the Revolution, Milk of Amnesia. Mm -hmm. the, screen, the screenplay, Your, your Kunst is Your Waffen. <laughs> Chicas 2000. Con que culo se sienta la cucaracha? With what ass does the cockroach sit? <laughs> A philosophical meditation. <laughs> um, and most recently, Post Plastica, which she presented at the Museo del Barrio. Um, she, these have been collected in a volume titled appropriately uh, I, Carmelita Dominicana, Performing Between Cultures. She has received the Performance Space 122 Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement in 2011, the prestigious Obi Award in 1999, the anonymous Was a Woman at the New York Foundation for the Arts and the Citizens Foundation Fellowships. We know her by the name of Carmelita Tropicana, but you might have also known her or have heard of her as the, songs, the songbird of Cuba, <laughs> or Goizaida's beauty queen, among other well-deserved titles. Help me welcome Carmelita Tropicana. Yeah. so informal. You're going to see a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, you're going to see me going like this, and like this, or Mr. Henry, can you play the first video? All right, I, before you oh, play sorry. the video, I oh, want sorry. to say that, you know, the last, that, that first image was of Post Plastica, and that was the, the last time that we saw each other, right? Uh, you were inside a shark tank. And it was at a Museo del Barrio, Carmelita was inside a shark tank, and she was being fed by this long line of people. And uh, the, the work was um, about uh, what's happening to the artists uh, nowadays, right? And commercialization, and uh, the sort of domestication of, of an, the attempted domestication, I would say in your case, of an artist. Um, and so, I wanted to, on that note, I wanted to sort of like, perhaps I was thinking, you know, maybe we could go back, is, is, is if you're making a statement about contemporary art, what was it like before when you started in the 80s, what those, you know, less uh, domesticated years, I usually don't think of domestication. I think more of like survival, yes. survival, and even beginnings. Before there was um, uh, Ellen, before there was the L word, before there was uh, uh, William Grace. There was wow, correct? Uh, Peggy Shaw is right here, and she can attest to that as Jackie too. And there, there are a lot of people that you know began in the eighties. I didn't begin in 1980 writing because I didn't know how, I hadn't even seen WOW yet. Basically, the thing that got me to, um, to 
you know, uh, start writing was the Wow Cafe. There was a festival given, it was amazing. They had women in all color shapes and sizes. And I thought, this is good. This is good. I have arrived. And uh, because it was, it was trying to figure out my sexuality with theater. Trying to figure out how that worked together or did it not. Were they mutually exclusive or very exclusive or very inclusive? So I went to WOW um, and Peggy Shaw was one who said, the first time that I got up at WOW it was because Peggy said, go up, do it, do it. And I had to like all of a sudden, I don't know, I, well, what do I do? And I said, well, okay, the only thing that I know is sing the, the Cuban national anthem and say a poem. <laughs> so Peggy was very influential. And then the two people that I'm going to talk a lot about um, is Uzi Parnes, my longtime collaborator, uh, and Ella Troiano. Uh, my biological sister and also longtime collaborator, both of them kind of helped me to create a lot of the work. But uh, the first, you know, the first thing that I did, because I hadn't written things that were uh, plays or anything, I hadn't gone to Intar yet. Um, so what I, what I first did was a little bits of pieces of uh, performance art. And this is the one documented performance art, because my sister was smart enough to say, document it, document it. <laughs> and I was like, really? Okay. So she documented it, and I got the NIFA Award for Performance Art, and it's called Chicken Sushi. Roll it. <laughs> Uh, 
club chandelier who Uzi Parnes used to run it with Ella Torriano and uh, had a lot of shows with amazing people, Karen Finley, Holly Hughes, Peggy Shaw, Lois Weaver, lots of people. At, at um, uh, Club Chandelier, you had a sh you had a variety show of sorts. I chit chat with Carmelita yes. Tropicana. Yes. Was that where the the character Carmelita Tropicana? How could you, could you tell us about it? By this time, Carmelita has already evolved. I mean, yes. you had been performing yes. in Wow. You had already uh, you know been an actress, an actor with uh, Holly Hughes and. Uh, yeah. Well, of horniness and all of that, um, and you know, you like the ambience, and you were inspired also perhaps by the ambience of Lois Saida. So, tell us a little bit about how does Carmelita come about? I mean, how does she emerge out of all of that and about this combination of cultures? Okay, I um, I was trying to figure out. Uh, uh, I went to Wow. And at WOW, there was a woman who was giving a, uh, a writing course, a comedy writing. And she needed to have five people. And, you know, I never remember jokes. Never. The punchline or anything, oh, how, what was that? So I never remember jokes. I have never even thought of writing a joke. So, it, you know, to me it was like, but she was cute. And, you know, and she needed the five people. And with the five people, you know, she wouldn't give the class until five people took it. So I said, okay, I'll sacrifice myself, you know. And I was good, I stayed after class, so I was very good. Uh, so I took the class, and that is, and at the same time I was taking the comedy course, I was also going um, with Holly Hughes, who had a show called The Well of Corniness. And we were about to do it on the radio, live. And I thought to myself, oh my God. God. There were two things happening, you know, at the same time. I was trying to do the comedy class, and I thought, I told the woman, I can't do comedy as myself, as Alina. No, this, I, I'm embarrassed. I mean, it's like, well, I grew up and, you know. <laughs> no, no, this doesn't. And she said, okay, do a character. Do a character. You know, I said, okay, that might work. And then I was cast in Holly Hughes, The Will of Horniness, as Al Dente, Chief of Police. Um, and, you know, Georgette, and uh, when we had to do it over the radio, Peggy Shaw was, you know, in it also, and when we had to do it over the radio, they said, okay, we're going to go over the radio, and I thought, oh my God, I can't be, I mean, I'm a civil servant, what if I, you know, I could be mayor of the city of New York, and if they found out that I was the one who screamed every time they, you know, well of horniness, you know, and so I thought, oh no, I need, a, I, I need another name, and the name came up like really fast, and all of a sudden the clock was ticking, and I'm like, okay, let me be Carmelita Tropicana, and that was it. You know? That was it, it just think, came up? I didn't, yeah, I didn't think about it, it's like, okay, let me come up with something, because <laughs> I couldn't be me. So, but you, so you developed, and then, I, yes, and then I did the little, you know, uh, shows at WOW, you know, which was yeah. like a little stand-up, and, mm -hmm. and then, uh, Intar saw me, and Intar wanted me to do uh, a workshop with them, a, a musical theater workshop, because they thought, oh, this is fun, she's funny, maybe she can write, and the only thing I had written was, you know, a couple of months, nothing bigger than that. And then, at the same time also, I was going to WOW, and Peggy Shaw said, oh, you should get a show, you should get a show, a full show. I go like, I, I can't. So then I go, okay, wait a second, let me get Uzi Parnas. he can help me, he can help me write a show. And Uzi, you know, was great because he could help write the show, direct, because he's really good at directing, and could also, you know, dress me up, <laughs> take the shoes out, ask can my sister check this out, you know. So the two of them have very visuals, really great visuals. Um, and that really was part of the, even the Car Carmelita character, which is really important, you know, what you wear, it was very much what was, uh, at that time, I wore fruit, fruits. You know, uh, I've gone on to full fur, camouflage, <laughs> saran wrap, you know, it has progressed, progressed. Flamingo <laughs> camouflage. Yeah. Yes, so it has progressed. But, um, uh, so, so then we thought, okay, let's invent, Carmen, uh, you know, the character, then can be in big shows. They can, she can be, a, you know, a main character in all these shows. So we started doing different, different shows. Um, where Carmelita was the main character, mm -hmm. and it was set in Havana. 
Yes. And so... Yeah, because, I mean, what is interesting, one of the things that, that I find fascinating about Carmelita, Carmelita, we call you Carmelita. I mean, Carmelita, Carmelita sort of has expanded and taken over part of Alina's life. Yes. Carmelita is, is, so Carmelita seems to me kind of, uh, of more than a character. Uh, but more like a medium. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when you are <laughs> when you are possessed by Carmelita, yes. you can access yes. so many other characters <clears throat> and so many other situations. Yeah. So how did the how did the, she, the, the other characters develop? The and other this char well, the other characters in the story, uh, Uzi was really great. That that you know we collaborate, you know, writing together as I collaborate with my sister Ella. And um, what we did, the first show was called Memories of the Revolution. And what I had was, my father was a revolutionary who actually fought in Castro's Cuba. So we took some of his stories and then, you know, kind of like, you know, it's, you mix fact with fiction. And we actually put all the girls, all the wow girls together. Uh, because it was a review, you know, uh, Milk of Nation was the first show, Candela was the second. And we put all these women together that had different accents. I mean, you know, they were not Latinas, because I didn't know any Latinas except for one, you know, uh, Ana Maria Simo, but basically, I was, except for, and, and then there was uh, Intar, which is another another place altogether. So I had to combine. Wow was the, uh, was black, he was gay, and he was a leper. Rodrigo. You know? Rodrigo. Rodrigo, right. Rodrigo, right. Okay, so thank you, thank you. <laughs> So, Rodney. you know, uh, over, and, and he was called Rodney all the time. And so we took him, but we then went, you know, we just used him, but then it, it, the story did not follow his real, you know, it was just using that idea. So, uh, Candela is a piece, a lot of our pieces were both, you know, you uh, acted, live, live, and we had a lot of film. And in this so. one you have part of the... <coughs> family that you have been creating, exactly. right? You have Machito, yes. uh, yeah. and also, well, not in this one, but in, an, in other ones you have the character of Pingalito. Right. <laughs> That's another one. Little... Dick. Pinga. Little okay. dick. Um, but the dick hasn't come in yet. He hasn't come in. Okay. So let's see. Let's see. We all have them. I, Carmelita Tropicana, have them. Of that fateful night, my audition in Tropicana. I remember my brother Machito boy, the way they brought me in through the back. We were both so nervous and excited. The music was playing. The Tropicanets were dancing. It was a dream come true to be in Mr. Rodney's spectacles at the greatest nightclub in the world, the Tropicana. Mr. Rodney makes. <laughs> Mr. Rodney picks the most beautiful girls, all sizes, shapes, colors, with sensuous bodies like Coca-Cola bottles, the little eight-ounce kind and the large sixteen-ounce kind. Tropica dates are wearing great costumes, all colors, but no shoes or hats. Mr. Rodney told them to leave the shoes and hats in the dressing room. The Tropica dates are great. They do the picking and the wriggling steps. And what synchronization! Oh, these girls are better than the rockets at the Radio City Music Hall. Mr. Rodney loves perfection. He rehearses the girls a lot. He makes the girls do the steps over and over and over until they get it just right. And what patience Mr. Rodney has. Oh, he is a saint. But my baby brother Machito and I know the moment of truth has come. So he goes to, to introduce me to Mr. Rodney. He says, Mr. Rodney, this is my sister Carmelita. She just finished 10 dancing lessons at the Fred Astaire studio. One look at me, and I can feel the vibrations between Mr. Rodney and myself. He says, yes, 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 Carmelita. You are the talent I need. So I go to join the chorus line. But first, I take off my dress. And underneath, I have a beautiful costume made 
from the lace of my mother's wedding gown in my own Holy Communion dress. <laughs> so beautiful. I joined the Tropicanets. They are so friendly, the girls. They say, hi girl, what's your name? How are you doing? They give me a kiss and I begin to dance. I move like no one else. I have such rhythm. I am what you call unique. Mr. Rodney is watching a machito serving him his drink. He says, Daiquiris with three maraschino cherries give him inspiration. I am dancing and dancing, but somehow, I, I don't know, I get a presentimiento, something bad is going to happen. But I continue to dance because I know I am a born Tropicanet and my papa will be so proud to watch his little girl Carmelita dancing like this. Even Mr. Rodney cannot believe his eyes. He is full of emotions. Oh, we are dancing and the music is playing. And then two guys come in. Uh, I don't know. I never seen them before. Uh, they look like American. Yes, American tourists from Chicago. One guy is short, and the other tall. They gonna talk to Mr. Rodney. Mr. Rodney look like he don't feel very well. Like maybe he's got uh, I don't know, something wrong, like maybe he's got a bad stomach ache, and then everything is chaos. We hear machine gun shots, machine guns. Oh my God, Mr. Rodney, he falls on the ground. <laughs> the two guys, they go and they put the machine gun on my baby brother Machito's tray. My brother picks the machine gun up. Oh, it is hot. The Tropicanets, they run away screaming. <laughs> I run to Mr. Rodney, I pick him up in my arms. Oh, Mr. Rodney, he's bleeding. He takes something out of his pocket to give to me. It's a little dolly, a ballerina. Oh, how cute. Then Mr. Rodney whispers to me, I don't do work for people like that. I don't work for the law. I don't do Vegas. And he dies in my arms. Oh, Mr. Rodney, murdered because he refused to work in the Tropicana franchise. The mob opens up in Las Vegas. A martyr who refused to sell his soul. I will try to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> with Uzi Fernandez, yes. right? And, 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 and so, you, and you place, uh, I, I love the, the voiceover, I love the narration, uh, the asynchronicity of it, you know, and it absolutely, uh, it makes it, uh, it, it gives you, um, uh, it, it, it shows up the, 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 the falseness or, uh, between the two, and, um, uh, so this is before. This is around the same time as Memorias. Right. And but this is this is a kind prequel. of a prequel, right? Yes. Because it, the Memorias de la Revolución started out, and Carmelita was already the head of a revolution, a revolution that no one's written about. So that's why she has to write this revolution. Nobody knows this revolution that happened pre the other revolution, you know, in 1955. So she, you know, is the leader, you know, and she. Um, is the, the head of Tropicana, and Machito, who you just saw here, uh, played by Maureen Angelus, mm -hmm. um, who's uh, one fifth of the Lesbian Brothers, um, uh, was but placed by baby brother Machito. Machito and, yes. and basically, Memorias is the story of Carmelita, how she is, um, is a head of a revolution in Cuba, um, tries to buy guns from a German spy, Lata Harry, the daughter of, <laughs> daughter of Mata Hari, and, and, and together, uh, what happens is that Machito gets put in, Memorias, Machito gets put in jail. Um, and he gets put in jail, the second act is really Carolita leaving, you know, leaving uh, Cuba, and it all happens, it's sort of a, a mashup of Lifeboat, if anybody has seen uh, the movie Lifeboat, uh, you know, um, and it's, you know, it happens in a lifeboat, it's Hitchcock, it happens in a lifeboat, and basically people are trying to survive. 
But what we mixed up with that is also that Carmelita has an apparition by the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary, you know, is played, everybody, you know, in Memorias, is, it's a gender bender. Everybody plays, the, uh, the women all play male and female. There's eight women in the cast, but the only male is really that appears, appears on film as the Virgin. Mm -hmm. And that's Uzi Parnes as the Virgin, as the mother, you know, because in Cuba there's a patron saint called La Virgen de la Caridad. La Virgen de la Caridad, it's like the Guadalupe Virgin, and, um, you know, she. La Caridad del Pobre. Okay, La Caridad, thank you very much. Mira. <laughs> it's a Juan, the Cuban, Cubano here. Um, la Caridad del Pobre, but she, you know, but the Virgin appeared to three fishermen. So we twist that around and, you know, we have three Fisher women. And it's Carmelita, Lada Harry, and Mari Macha. And for those of you who don't know, Mari Macha means tomboy, you know, like the heavy, you know. And people on the show didn't know, was she, was she not? It was kind of like a tranny sort of situation that people didn't know. Um, a lot of the people that acted in our show, like Mo Angelos, and that was played by Peggy Healy. Mari Macha was Peggy Healy, um, another one-fifth of the Lesbian Brothers. So uh, Pe um, Peggy uh, was Mari Masha, and Mo was, uh, you know, everybody said, oh my god, these, they, they almost look like men. You know, they were really cute. I mean, we had girls that were going like, ooh, I call them a name. And they were straight. They go like, wow, those are cute guys. So it was, we were playing the gender bending roles. Um, and playing, you know, playing with the religious iconography. The, the religious iconography right. that yes, it signifies like, the Cuban nation, right? The, right. The, yeah. Yes, and, and we were leaving, and then uh, Uzi, who played the Virgin, played the Virgin as um, uh, with, uh, with a Yiddish accent, and he spoke Yiddish. <laughs> you know, Shalom Aleichem, you know, right? You know, and so he did that. And basically, the virgin, should, uh, the virgin tells Carmelita that her revolution will no longer be, you know, uh, her revolution. Her revolution is to give dignity to Latin and third world women. So go out into the world and, get, you know, and that's what we took from it. And then we, we took that, like, go out into the world and your, your art is your weapon, is what the virgin tells me. Your art is your weapon. You go lose. forth. And then that became a film that we used that that uh, those words, but we twisted it into German, your Kunst is your Waffen, your art is your weapon. So it's sort of like, so everything is sort of like, kind of base one thing and the other that there's layers that then continue through the, through the strand of the work. Um, and one of the things that also the Virgin said in this piece was <coughs> that, excuse me, that if uh, I never touched a man, you know, I would forever be nine, uh, eight, uh, what, what, what was it? 19, you know. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> okay, no problem, <laughs> you know. And that was, you know, I didn't have to say it was, you know, but it was like, whoa, yeah, okay. So as you see, 19. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, this was your, your way of um, approaching the revolution, but in a kind of, Sideways, right. because you didn't talk about the revolution. Right. We didn't talk about the experience of the 60s or people leaving Cuba because of the revolution or your family. Or you talked Actually, about you yes. went before, sort of like the period right before the revolution. Except in in in, in memorias, there's just a tiny little bit, tiny little bit of the third act that um, we had like a, a chief of police, my nemesis in memorias of the revolution, memories of the revolution is his chief of police based on a real chief of police in Cuba, you know, from the stories my father had told me, who was a torturer who had killed a lot of people. So basically that was sort of true, but then what happens in the third act is that that person, Capitan Maldito, actually ends up in the 60s, you know, at the cafe, at, you know, cafe Agogo, the Tropicana Agogo in the 60s. And that way we didn't have to change the sets. <laughs> It was a great way to, okay, Tropicana here, Tropicana there, and, you know, pretty much stays kind of similar. But, but it was, he had come after the revolution, 
So, and he was now a janitor. It's like, a, 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 you know, a reference to people who came out of Cuba that then had to do different jobs here. So here was the chief of police who all of a sudden had to be a janitor and found out that Carmelita was playing at the, you know, at the Tropicana Go and wanted to go and see. So, but, so it was a little bit of that England. And you get your, your venture and stuff. Exactly. Okay. But, yeah, so there seems to be, I mean, you, instead of dealing with the revolution directly, you go like mm -hmm. to the to the period right before the revolution, right. Right. And, uh, and then you continue, that revolution continues. It seems as if you were just like, create this art where you continue that revolution in New York, yeah. at the New Tropicana, right. a different kind of revolution. Right. Sort of like that little figure that he is handing this person, the, the Carmelita, also gives us the idea that there's going to be a continuation, yeah. and that continuation might be in the diaspora. Um, after this, you went on to uh, Milk of Anisha. Right. There were a lot of other shows, but you know, since we're covering lots of things, we got you know. So, yeah. But it is true. You know, like what we're going is like. Milk of Amnesia, which is different. But in Milk of Amnesia, yes, you, you dealt directly with the Cuban Revolution during a certain period. I mean, you went back to Cuba, and that was a very, that's a, that's a great achievement in your work, and also a real departure. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? You actually went to Cuba in the, during the special period in the 90s. Right. Um, Ella had gone before, um, and you decided to Return to Cuba, and as a result of that uh, trip, um, you wrote this big piece, right. Milk of Amnesia. Right, and I knew that if I went to Cuba, there would be a show. I knew it. Because <laughs> I was really like, oh my God, can I go back? And what is it like? I mean, I haven't been there in so long. What, you know, I was sort of a little bit nervous and anxious about it. In fact, like the very first time, they, they, um, I got on the plane. I didn't have my visa. I didn't understand the visa was, you know, I had to call somebody to have the visa come to meet me in the airport, and I didn't understand that, so after all these years, I get to the, uh, to the airport, and they sent me right back. Oh. And it was like, oh my God! <laughs> and, and believe me, it was a trek, you know, at that time, you know, in Cuba, there was no gasoline, it was called the special period, meaning no food, no gasoline, um, no electricity. I mean, basically, people were really skinny, uh, because they didn't have food, they didn't have even little things like you know I, I gave people my um, my razor because they you know they couldn't shave. I mean it was really tough, really it, really. Tough. It was I mean in that piece in Milk of Amnesia there's a phrase that recurs and it was the phrase of the moment. No, it's fácil. Right. It's not easy. Right. No. And they, they kept saying meaning it's really hard <laughs> as hell. You know because there was no I mean it really was. The, um, the Soviet Union had fallen, so the money that was being given to Cuba at that point had, you know, had fallen. By the way, I'm sorry, guys, why don't you come sit here? Come, come. I'm not, it's not audience participation. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that there's empty chairs if you want to. If not, okay. They're, they're not, they, they don't want to. Anyway, um, so, uh, but, the sh but this was a solo. And it was my first full-length solo. Right. And I did it with my sister Ella Trajano, who directed it. And it's a more, instead of the um, big, broad, uh, uh, you know, lots of girls, this was like a more uh, intimate right. kind of, you know, piece. And even more minimalist. It was just, everything was black, you know, well, white. But it had multiple voices. Right. The writer, um, Alina Trajano, is right. there, is present right. is in, it, first in, time in her absence, right. because it's uh, a tape. There's a tape in which you are listening to your experiences. There's a testimonial aspect to that. Right. Yeah, it, you know, uh, the way it was directed was like, there was a white cube and everything was white. You know, what I was wearing was white, in, in the sense of milk of amnesia. And when you have amnesia, everything is a blank. You know, and it's sort of like the idea that, you know, you're assimilating, so you're losing who you are in a way. Mm -hmm. So it begins, and, and a lot of it is a back and forth from the public space, which is the white cube, where you know things get played a little bit more campy, to the other space, 
that is like the backstage and you just hear um, a voiceover, you know, like a voice narration that, that you know, happens. So it was like a, a and, and it's, it, I, I think of it as a travelogue, a travelogue where Carmelita and me as the writer go back to Cuba, they both have amnesia. Carmelita's amnesia came from, um, from, uh, uh, you know, yes, uh, wrestling with chocolate pudding and hurting her head. <laughs> And, you know, and mine is uh, the amnesia of like not knowing what is it like to go back to your country, what is it like to go back. And in, in it, I also have other voices. That, uh, there's a colonial force because Carmelita, you know, when she can't remember things, she falls into what's called a coma, a collective unconscious memory appropriation attack. <laughs> and in that attack, she, you know, she appropriates others' memories. And one of the memories that she appropriates is, um, uh, you know, a horse, a, you know, a horse in colonial times. And another, you know, another one is a pig in, you know, in that modern day Cuba. Because at that time people were speaking. The pig is incredible. saying people got sick from eating the pork. So, so, but people did keep animals at the house, you know, in, in, you know, in the apartment. So that was sort of, yes, in the bathroom and all that. And, uh, and here's where also Pingalito appears. Pingalito appeared, uh, you know, Little Dick. Um, and what he does in Milk, uh, in, in, in Memoria de la Revolución, in Chicas 2000, and in Milk, is that he breaks the narrative. There's a narrative going, and he comes out in like a cubanazo, like a Cuban man. You know, he's gonna go, hey, let me tell you. So he just, he's one of those people that's gonna tell you what's going on, because he's, he's an authority on just about everything. And um, so with that, I think, what? Yeah, let, let's, uh, let's see Pingalito. I don't know, yeah, here. Okay. Thank you. 
go to the next clip. And um, yeah, thank you. I don't remember much. I feel like a tourist in my own country. Everything is new. I walk everywhere hoping I will recall something, anything. I have this urge to recognize and be recognized. To fling my arms around one of those Seba trees and say, hey, I remember you from the park when I went with Cristobalina, my nan who had Chinese eyes, kinky hair, and used to sing, Credo, no marques las horas. I want to crack on the sidewalk to open up and say, yes, I saw you when you jumped over in your patent leather shoes holding onto your grandfather's index finger. But it doesn't happen. There is no recognition. So I do what Ronald Coleman did in the movie when he had amnesia. And what Cubans do when they go back. I visit the house I was born in. 319 de la calle 8, entre Quinta y Tercera. The address pops out as I've been there yesterday. I'm nervous. But why? It's just a house. Oh my God, that's, that's the house I was born in. This is my house. You see over here, over here there was a little patch of ground dirt and uh, in the corner there was a slug that lived right here. I used to poke it with a stick very gently. <laughs> the slug is gone. And over here, this is where I planted my mango tree. We had invented a new game, agrarian reform. We had to cultivate the land. It was by this mango tree that I had an epiphany. I was digging at the dirt, seeing how my seed was doing when I heard her footsteps. She had long hair tied into a ponytail. She had very red lips and dreamy eyes like a cow. When I saw her, I yelled at her and ran over to her. I kissed her creamy cheeks. She put me down in an instant. She looked at me. I went to hide by my mango tree. I was sweating. My heart was beating very fast. I looked at my hands that were dirty from the ground. I knew then that this was no ordinary kiss. This would mean a lot more. And right away he... Because we're, we're trying yes. to go fast, so... Um, okay, so that yes. was Milk of Amnesia. Milk of Amnesia. Milk of, it's... it's uh, um, it's interesting how you, you know, this place, I mean, this is part of a genre, um, a Cuban genre, a Cuban-American genre, the return to Cuba, you know, and when you return to Cuba, you go to your, your house, the house where you used to live, you might meet some of the people who live there, um, you go to the Cementerio Colón, uh, to meet the dead, um, and what you did. Uh, so it's interesting how you do the same kind of itinerary, but uh, your your memory is is so much larger um, in, in this piece. Your memory is kind of hyperbolic. He like the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, so it's hyperbolic, it's, and, and it's, it seems to be a response, right, yes. to, to, uh, to, to texts like uh, Memorias de Subdesarrollo. De Su yeah, it's a film, what he said was, a, there's a film, a really famous film, and actually I named the piece, no, not Milk of Amnesia, but I named uh, the Memoria de la Revolución, Memoria, uh, Memoria de la Revolución was sort of like a take off on, uh, memories of underdevelopment. It was a really famous film by Gutierrez Alea, and um, that you know that uh, he actually had another film called Fresa y Chocolate, Strawberry and Chocolate, that was you know a queer, the first queer film in Cuba. Um, so using those references are really important. So. Um, and in that, in, in, in that one, you have, as I said, your memory is much larger. It includes yeah. the memory of uh, the colony, the memory of a horse. Yeah. You know, you manage to, to, you know, very, um, to, to, to have a lot of texture, right? I mean, something very, very serious, and at the same time, you know, you explode this memory. You go from absolutely no memory to actually acquiring multiple memories. Yeah. And the, the next, the next uh, piece is is um, all about 
uh, memory, in a sense. I mean, uh, 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 the film. Oh, the film. The film. The film. The, the film called the Parmelia Takara Your Kunst is Your Waffle. Your Kunst is Your Waffle. Which is a <laughs> day in the life of. Of Carmelita Tropicana. Carmelita Tropicana is arrested, she's an activist, <laughs> she is, uh, she's, in, she's now in the Lower East Side, and, uh, and yeah. you know. Uh, and this is a film, uh, you know, basically it was done by Ella Traiano, and um, it's played all over, you know, PBS, ITBS gave us monies to, you know, do the film, um, and it is shot, in, a lot of it in the Lower East Side, and also in a jail, um, and uh, you know, a real during jail. the time, yes, a real jail. Um, and she goes in our building. Our in our building, that's right. Please in her bedroom. Yes, in my bedroom. <laughs> in my bedroom, in my home. Yeah, <laughs> all of that. <clears throat> so, because somebody, somebody said, "Oh, where did you shoot?" Oh, Second Street. <laughs> it's like, like, oh, that's what, you know, and Tompkins Square Park, and all of that. And we used a lot of the people there at the time. Um, and it was a time when it was, uh, there was a lot of politics, it was the culture wars, it was 1994, the culture wars were happening. Um, and for those of you who don't, everybody knows about the culture wars, I mean three, it, 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 you know, it, uh, a lot of the NEA was putting down people who were having work that was political, like uh, the, the NEA four were Holly Hughes, Karen Finley, John Fleck, and I'm forgetting that, and Tim Miller. The three of them, the four of them got, um, as our Holly uh, likes to call them, the four, the three homosexuals and the straight girl, you know, <laughs> like a band. Um, and basically they got denied their grants. Uh, they rescinded, they had won them and they rescinded them because they thought, they, they really said that they were, you know, uh, queer work and it was, you know, it was porn and all, everything, you know. And it was like Maplethorpe was being, you know, also exactly. denied. I mean, it was just a whole, you know, the culture wars were really important. At the same time, there was WAC, the Women's Action Coalition. So it was a very political time. There was AIDS, you know, uh, there was Lesbian Avengers, ACT UP. So there was all this, you know, political, you know. So we made Carmelita be the... Um, the person who was a performance artiste by night and a, you know, a, um, uh, a political activist by day. And she goes and she ends up in jail because actually she's defending a, um, uh, a, a, uh, an abortion clinic. And that at the time, I mean, we kind of forget, but at the time that was happening even in New York, that there was, you know, that people had to fight to keep these, you know, these abortion clinics open, and we're all lined up, and you know, you have to prevent people from breaking through. So it was, it was a, it was a very. Um, and several of the characters are going through have a past that is kind of a past of violence, and there is a moment in the film where you sort of go back in a kind of campy, sensationalist way, go back to Carmelita, goes back to her, also to Cuba to the death, to the killing of her Ukita, her Right, because the women are in jail. In order to pass time in jail, what do you do? You tell stories. So we told one of the stories that happened in our real, you know, in our real family where it was a love story of this man who was uh, obsessed and actually, you know, killed my aunt. He was really obsessed and, and, and it came out of the newspaper, so we got the newspaper and we put it there. So, and this is told in a black and white kind of, um, uh, very expressionistically shot, sort of, uh, would you call it expressionistic? You know, and with um, uh, the music was kind of like a takeoff on, on what's his name, uh, the, 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 the uh, Piazzo, yes, uh, Astro Piazzolla, thank God that they're here, Astro Piazzolla, <laughs> you know, so it was that, and we mixed a lot of genres, we mixed, um, in the film, we mix, you know, the telenovela with the American musical, with, uh, you know, the experimental film that that little movie was kind of experimental. Um, so all these things are in it. It's, it's like a conglomerate of, you know, uh, of different styles and different voices. Right. And, I, and I think, you know, it's throughout the, the film, I mean, something that is, that is common is this, this impression uh, of of a violence, of a 
of a path of violence or of the violence that is happening. One of the characters is actually has AIDS and, and the devastation of the, of, the, of the Lower East Side and the neighborhoods. Um, and it's in that context that they're thrown in jail and then they, there is this amazing scene. At the very end. Where there yeah. is this amazing scene where they prisioneros. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, because we, we do fantasy too. So how they are in jail, they're talking and all that, and then we have <laughs> <laughs> also with the lower classes, you know, in a certain, the hoi polloi, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, making fun of the authority figure. Right. So we use that a lot. It's the Cuban sort of humor that we do. It's a way of lightening things, you know, almost like emptying things of meaning, you know, the, the purpose of Chodeo is just to continue in Chodeo and Relato. And then at the end, there's a very beautiful scene in which you are in, uh, in a stand-up, um, uh, in a performance, and uh, this character who was uh, dancing here, who had AIDS, has died. Mm -hmm. And as you are doing the stand-up, uh, the camera shows her uh, as if it were, you know, uh, as, as if she were alive. It's yeah, and it's sort of like, it's this, yes, and she goes like, oh, this is, you know, she says, oh, this is the last song, and this is for you, Dee. So the same Prisioneras song plays, Carmelita is on stage, and we see flashbacks of, of Dee, who's one of the people. And what's really interesting, she's in jail, but she's the white woman, in a way. And there's like these three Latinas, and she's the one that really was the criminal. So we kind of twist the idea that, you know, we always have the stereotype of, like, the, the Latinas are going to be the ones that are the, you know, the criminals. And we sort of twisted it around and made D be the the person who mugs me in the very <laughs> beginning of the of the piece, and we all end up in jail together. And then she, you know, she dedicates the, the song because D has all of a sudden has you know uh, has taken all you know her life got redeemed you know by um, by now you know she has her own company and she's an exterminator. And it's it's a takeoff on and it's a takeoff where you know in jail there's a big roach and Carmelita and everybody else is scared they don't want to kill it and Dee just goes oh God and that roach was really expensive to rent okay and we didn't hurt the roach but it was so expensive to rent and there was somebody with a little it was so cold in the jail that they had a little um, hair dryer to make sure that the roach was alive so all you know important things. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and at the end, she is in this little garden. Again, yeah, she's in the little garden. With Las Casitas. And, um, re, one of the reasons I accepted this was because I wanted to know about your sex life. <laughs> about your hot sex life. Um, um, anybody? I'm free. <laughs> I'll tell them. 
If anybody stays, if, it, if somebody wants to be back tonight, I'll, I'll you know. When I, I never tell. Yes, but I, when I asked you, you said, oh, no, I'm not my, you know, my work is not about love. My work is about history, her story, her story. And uh, as I read it, all of a sudden I realized there is sex all over the place. Well, I don't know if there's sex, but there is, a, a, you know, love, but it's, it's in a very, it's queer, but it's in a very, it's not driving, but it's not driving love, the piece. But it's interspecies. There's interspecies love. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> there is, because is it queer love interspecies? <laughs> <laughs> with what ass? The, or, or, okay. With what ass? Did you, did you want to talk about with what ass? Okay, uh, let's talk with, because uh, we're running out of yeah, time. Yeah, we're running out of time. Um, so we won't see any more of this, but this is my bed. Um, and, and in it, it has a little bit, uh, you know, why don't we play just a little bit and maybe I can. Can you play a little? Yeah. And then you see if it can Hello? The fine ball action is set for high noon. <laughs> you will be picked up by your kid. Uh, hold on, I have another call. <laughs> Papi! Que tu vida? Una sorpresa. Un hermanito. Ajá. Al hospital. ¿De qué? De la próstata. Espera un momento. Two thirds of all the AIDS cases will be among women and children. Do not put me on hold. See you at nine at Tompkins Square Park. Don't wear big earrings. Gold knockers will not open corporate doors. Don't wear fuchsia fingernail polish with steak tartar lipstick. Experts agree that a barrier to Hispanic women achieving corporate success is none other than fashion. Okay, so we can cut it, you know, there. No, don't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta move. You gotta move. It's the age of the tweet. <laughs> with what ass does the cockroach say it's Carmelita? Yes, with what? That's like the existential question for us Latinos. And actually, it's a, that's a Yoruban saying that actually means um, uh, when you want to put somebody down, you know, it's like, who, who you think you are? You know, like, you, yeah, what, what, you think you can sing opera? Please. You know, and it's, you say, oh, yeah, okay, cool, really. You know, so that's, you know, what I ask is a cockroach say. It's sort of like a strange saying, but that's what it means. I had to, I had to call my father and find out what it meant because I had no clue. You know, I thought it was just existential, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, about, you know, I uh, started to do a thing about uh, Elian Gonzalez, and I'll just talk a little bit about it, because if not, we won't get to the last, and I did, you know, I want to get to the last thing, because there's visual, and this one has no visuals, because um, the piece was done, but when it was uh, done, um, the, the visuals are not terribly good. So um, I was going to read for you, but I think I won't read. Just imagine me playing a cockroach, uh, a parrot, a um, tranny cat, a bulldog. Uh, you know, so it's I'm a beast. It's a bestiary, you know. And and the the parrot is named Catalina, and the parrot you know goes. <laughs> And, and she, you know, is best friends because she has a lot of money. And uh, in terms of, she doesn't have money, but she's owned by the uh, singer of the Nueva Vista Social Club. So her old man and her, I don't know if you know about parrots, but parrots, this is where queer love comes in. Um, the, uh, you know, the parrot and the cockroach are a queer family. They're, they're bound together. It's like all of a sudden they met and the cockroach at least can eat you know what the parrot has in the in the you know in the cage, 
and, the, and in turn, the cockroach goes and plays, you know, spy for, you know, the, the bird who cannot fly around, who always has to be in a cage, pretty much. And of course, Catalina is in love with, you know, there's a real bond between parrots and their owners. And so they're, they're so, you know, meshed together that, um, you know, the old man can really do, you know, the, the cranium, the, you know, that has a little bit of a, a sexual kind of connotation and, and, you know, and Martina just, you know, Catalina just goes like, oh, you know, wow, 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 you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, and the roach just kind of goes, oh my god, a cockroach and a parrot that the relationship is not healthy, okay? <laughs> and she goes to contemplate, and when she contemplates, she contemplates on a, on a, um, a, a postcard. And she says, you know, the bees and the ants are the workaholics, but me, nah, nah. We, we, you know, we are bon vivants. Eat, drink, and be merry, but the exterminator cometh. <laughs> Sometimes I don't understand why people, you know, hate us so much. We've been around since the dinosaurs, and we are not extinct, why? Hmm? Because we are smart people, yeah. You know, how many times they hit us with a broom, then they go find a pan and a newspaper to pick the cadaver up and surprise! <laughs> and then they yell, coño, where did that maldita picaracha go? <laughs> so that's, you know, so, and it really was the story of the Elian Gonzalez, who's a shipwrecked Cuban boy, um, and his uh, custody battle was, you know, was a big international, you know, fight. Question, why did you decide to tell it from the vantage point. I mean, it's, it's all told or narrated by animals. Because it's like a fable and it's a way of, of telling. First of all, I thought, oh my god, it's a five-year-old boy. What do five-year-olds listen to? Well, it's fairy tales. And both people were trying to sell him fairy tales of like what happens in Cuba, what happens here exactly. in the U.S. Basically, they're just like, you know, and, and I thought, oh my god, I remember this this story that I heard about, you know, a cockroach called Martina. And, you know, I didn't know much about it, but then somebody from the Smithsonian actually sent it, sent me the, the story of La Cucarachita Martina that's actually called Perez, uh, Perez and Martina. And, and, you know, it's a cockroach that, you know, is really very clean. I love the idea yeah. that the cockroach is really clean. <laughs> and, and all the, you know, and, and it's also, I thought it was a Cuban, the well, story is Puerto Rican, okay? <laughs> so it's Puerto Rican. You know, I was taking it for him, it's like, no. Yeah. So, you know. But it's very but widely it's, known. It's widely known all throughout Latin America, so taking that, but then mixing up all the animals. And again, I wanted to do what Anna DeBeer Smith did in Fires in the Mirror, which I don't know if you know, but that was, you know, uh, she took all these interviews and she played them all, but it was about um, the, the Cato story where this little boy had died and then there was violence and it really actually um, uh, pulled apart two different communities. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's great how you displace that violence. Yeah. And so, so it was basically taking that, you know, the idea right. that she did, but then I thought, oh, I'll be the beast Anna DeVere. <laughs> and, you know, the, I wanted to do it through animals so that they can tell the story for that. And that's what happened, you know. Um, and the rescue is really great also. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the rescuing, I mean, the telling of the shipwreck is, yeah. is amazing. And then the rescue yeah. by a female dolphin, yeah. not by the man also. And the right, dolphin. but, yeah, but, you know, like a lot of it, it has to do with the real story that happened to Elian. He was called the child of the dolphins because apparently no no shark got him because these dolphins were all around him. So I took a lot of you know you, I took everything, even a story that my friend who works for CNN, you know, had had you know had a horrible experience with these Cubans, you know, um, because they thought she was a communist, but she was just reporting for CNN. So I took a lot of these stories <laughs> and built them in, you know, to it. Um, so and Elian is in and. and you know, and he gets, of course, sent back. So, um, and then... And then, Post Plastica, post -plastica. which is, in a sense, about, as I said, oh, Carmelita is such a beast. It's about the, the, the non-human element uh, is very important about how art, in a sense, is, is wild. It has a non-human element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a beast. 
Um, yes, and, and um, post plastica, something I did with Ella Troiano, and uh, it was uh, at the Museo del Barrio, it was over four days, and what we did was took the whole museum. We had um, a, an exhibit of these amazing photographs that were in 3D. Uh, Richard, Pell. Richard Pell in the Unnatural Museum, and they were like 3D photographs of these weird, you know, fish that had been crossed with something else. I mean, they were really amazing photographs. And we also had lectures that had to do with themes that we brought up in the show. The show happens to be um, a live performance with an exhibit, with lectures, and um, it also has a final installation in the lobby. That's the final scene is an installation that, that was the shark that you saw in a shark tank. Uh, we were we were you know referencing Damien Hirst, you know the impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. So basically, and Alisa Schwartz was the person who uh, who designed that you know the sets for it. Um, and you know it was a story about like you know uh, uh, an artist. You know a lot of times it's about an artist, and it's about survival of the artist, survival of the species, ageism, you know commercialization of art. And you know we're we're going in terms of our you know uh, one of the main characters called Plastica, and um, it begins in the present. Carmelita, you know, is betrayed as an artist. She's betrayed by her protege Plastica, um, and you know, who steals an idea for a show. And what happens is he steals the idea from the show. Carmelita is desperate, not Carmelita. It's hope. So I'm not Carmelita, but it, you know, again, as he said, uh, as Arnaldo said, it was like you know a medium, uh, you know, Carmelita playing this this uh, uh, character called Ho, and I chose it because Ho, the Ho, she tries to sell herself, and she injects herself with Botox, but the Botox has expired, and basically she gets sent into um, uh, into you know the future, and then we have the second. <laughs> All very believable. <laughs> it can happen. Cryogenics, please. Um, and then you know we pick up the story in you know three thousand, where um, a woman bear, um, you know, which is a character that you know I sort of thought about. Um, Uzi and I did this piece called Chicas Two Thousand, um, and it was you know at the time uh, cloning had begun. The sheep. You know, and I was very interested in cloning. It's like things that interest me, you know, I sort of pick up. Um, and Ella and I were working and we really, liked, at that time, you know, the YouTube had just begun. I mean, it was something that we were doing and then we put it aside, we did other work, and then we came back to it. So then this kind of became, you know, post-plastica. And uh, she is woken up by a woman bear who's a scientist. And um, then there's a CEO who is the ruler of the planet, basically. Right, in a world that is totally commercialized and exactly. very um, exactly. virtual. Exactly. So but there is this hybrid, yeah. which is this woman, yeah. Ursa, yeah. Ursa, Latin for bear, right? And that's the one that you have a that whole as yes. a, an affair. Right. So let us <laughs> go to roll the videotape. The, the opening uh, scene, the opening movie. The dog owners are here. <laughs> and I have to tell you, Larry, amazing actor to work with. Amazing. <laughs> um, so as you can see, we love the species. Uh, the two parrots are here. Uh, papas. The two papas. So, yes, and then you end that last image that we presented at the very beginning. Let's go back to that last image uh, that we talked about at the very beginning of, the, of our conversation. Uh, you end up um, at the Museo Barrio in a shark tank. But before uh, that, before that, before you that, have. Like the um, scene with the bees, mm -hmm. and then the shark. And then the shark. And then you end up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very. Um, that. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that last image? No. Uh, yes. Uh, the Shark Tank again was, um, uh, a, you know, the idea that artists, how are they going to survive? Who's going? You know, how are we? How are we going to be doing it now? 
Um, and, and there's a toss up between, there's a, there's a fight between, you know, uh, the protege who's young and, you know, has got it all together. They know about branding, they know how to do things, and the old fashioned artist that, you know, is not great at techno stuff, may not even have a, you know, a, a website, you know, it's that, you know, and they have sort of like different values of how to make it, we, you know, right now it's about the business of art, and, and I'm not saying one versus the other, you know, I'm not, believe me, because we all need to be a little bit more business savvy, so that's not, but it's those ideas that are put in the piece, ageism, and how we all, you know, relate, and also there was a, you know, I, I do love animals, so it's a survival of the species in, you know, a, a part of it that's a um, referencing also like uh, La Jete by uh, Marker, um, we have an underground sequence. Uh, and that's shot with stills um, that Uzi shot. And uh, it's like people go to the underground. When they don't want to be part of the system, they have to, you know, get out of the grid and, you know, um, get their identities taken off and be part of the underground. And Carlita goes to the underground, she gets, um, she gets punished because she goes to the underground with Ursa, who is a political revolutionary, and then they end up, um, at the very end, the CEO, you know, plays a game with them about the bees, because bees it's one of, the, one of the people that's in the underground. It's like they're artists, political dissidents, and people who are trying to maintain the species alive. Maintain, you know, and we have um, a, a performer called Augusto Machado who plays the beekeeper. And he is actually keeping bees and making real honey. And the honey that the CEO has is like fake honey, blue honey. So that's a different, um, you know, it, it's a fake honey. Uh, so it's kind of like trying to survive, you know, trying to see how the species survive. Um, there's also a little poodle who, you know, we have as the dog that's going to survive the one animal that there is. So all those things we're playing with. And so the CEO, played by Aaron Markey, and like a Blackwell plays Ursa, you know, where you can play, you can play while we talk. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we have the B, so she's going to come up with uh, a game. Ancient home, we've you given you life, and you have betrayed us along with the hybrid. You have gone to the underground, and now it's time to accept punishment. Be careful what you wish for, it may come true. You love bees, here's a surprise. Let the games begin. Your day has come to learn discipline, humility, and above all, loyalty. Too far, you scoff at my brand of honey, which you improved. Yet I watched you slurp it right up. Why? Because it's addictive with all its chemicals. And besides, it's the only brand at the center. That is not the end. You think you've got the right answer? If you don't, I'll have to jolt you as well. <laughs> the YouTubes were stunning, especially that one with the elephant. It really expanded my repertoire for punishment. I suppose there's something to learning your ancient history after all. Now I'm going to ask you one more time. Why? Do you like my honey? Because it's blue and it tastes so good. Not quite. Ah, stop! Stop my answer. So you know what we're doing. You know, um, just trying to. Look, oh, she's more fast. Okay, uh, just <laughs> thank you. Um, so we're going to, hold on a second, I'm just going to tell you that uh, we're going to jump to what's called the massacre of the drones, it's something that happens in, uh, you know, for beekeepers, um, it, it's a, I love this story of like drones are the males and the female are the ones that really do the work, um, they're the worker bees 
And, you know, the males, the drones, are the pretty ones that, you know, they're kind of like hanging around and all they have to do is impregnate the, uh, the queen. That's their whole job. And if they do, they die. But if they don't, you know, they can hang out. But what happens is they can hang out until the winter comes. Because when the winter comes, you know, the hive has to close up. And when the hive closes up and there's not enough food for all those male drones, you know, they just start starving. And all the worker bees are going like, and they're smaller. And they're like, I mean, and it's really tragic. I think, because then they all, there's a body of male drones that just can't figure out. I mean, they had it so good. And, you know, they're running around, all they had to do was like, uh huh, that's it, Ooh, I'm, I'm cool. And all of a sudden, the gig is up. And, you know, they're all, they can't go in, it's cold, and they freeze, and they're, they're, they die of starvation, basically. And you see all their bodies scattered. So um, keep on going. I'll, I'll tell you when, Henry. Keep on, you know. I just want her to sing the song because I think it's so pretty. <laughs> yeah. I think. We planted a tree. Don't try and find me. Please don't you dare. Just live in my memory. Much darker ending and much darker uh, 